Well, the king has just celebrated his 75th birthday and what better birthday present for the monarch than the latest episodes of The Crown, which have just landed. Good for you. So what do those first four episodes show? You know, I think that's been the story of my whole life. They are all about Princess Diana and indeed her relationship with Dodie Fayed. Do you know anything about it? And their subsequent death in the Alma Tunnel in Paris on August the 31st, 1997. And as one has come to expect with The Crown, the production values are great. Diana and the other actors uh, play their roles extremely well. I would say the depiction particularly of Dodie's father, the former Harrods boss Mohammed Al Fayed, recently deceased, isn't a particularly attractive portrayal. In fact, it creates this image of a father who was constantly pushing his son into this relationship with Princess Diana because he wanted to improve his own status. And there's even a suggestion in the film that this is all really about Al Fayed trying to get British citizenship by having connections to the royals. It also depicts the royal family in the background having quite a few concerns about Diana's relationship with Dodie, not least because he's foreign and a Muslim. We also see the development of the King's relationship with Camilla Parker Bowles as she was then and the idea of this War of the Wales is continuing with Charles trying to reposition Camilla rather than being a hate figure as somebody who is integral to his life. Your attendance not only as my mother but symbolically as Queen would be transformative for Camilla. She will never be fully embraced by the public until she has your approval. He's trying to kind of cut a dignified figure in the face of the perception of Diana gallivanting around the Mediterranean, going on the Al Fayed yacht. And the press are on our tails constantly. Ending up in Paris with Dodie and all the rest of it. I kind of found some of the scenes depicting the lead up to Diana's death and indeed her death slightly mawkish. It's a bit uncomfortable at times. The two princes are depicted by actors. I mean, it's not a close likeness, but we can tell William and Harry played by a ginger-haired actor. But the build-up at Balmoral is there having this conversation with Diana on the phone, which we know happened, where obviously they don't know it's the last conversation they're going to have with their beloved mum. And then it kind of cuts to them brushing their teeth, oblivious to the horror that's about to unfold in the French capital. When are you going to tell the boys? <sighs> I wanted to let them sleep, delay it as long as possible. While they're sleeping, they still have a mother. Then we again cut to Charles breaking the news in the middle of the night in the Highlands. And what Netflix has done is when anyone breaks the news of her death, the audio goes completely silent, so you can only see the person mouthing the words and then the reaction of the people that are being told. Um, and obviously the reactions are very visceral. This is going to be the biggest thing that any of us has ever seen. You've got Prince Charles as he then was, bawling his eyes out when he goes to identify Diana at the hospital in Paris. You've obviously got the reaction of the princes and at times it does feel quite intrusive and people might say well it's all very well you saying that because you've written copy about Diana's death and subsequent copy about the royals in general but I suppose just to see it all recreated for entertainment feels a bit mawkish. Oh it's Diana calling for the boys. You've just missed them ma'am. The prince has waited for your call but have gone back out again. I'm so sorry, ma'am. There are moments as well where they bring Diana back as a ghost. So after she's died, she's brought back to have a conversation with her ex-husband. She's brought back to have a conversation with her mother-in-law, the Queen. The film completely recreates and does recreate it with a degree of accuracy. The Queen's address to the nation in the aftermath of Diana's death when it's accepted that the royal family didn't react to the outpouring of grief very well, they didn't lower the flag, they didn't come down to London quick enough. So that is recreated and subsequently there have been reports that Imelda Staunton, who plays Queen Elizabeth II, just did that scene in one take, which is certainly impressive. As is ever the case with The Crown, you've got fictionalised dialogue. Well, that's what I've been trying to tell you. 
based around factual events. And we know the facts happened as they rolled out because we know what happened. Historically, it's all been documented. But at the end of the day, again, and this has been the long running problem with the Crown, <sighs> these dialogues are made up by script writers. So nobody really knows exactly what happened behind the scenes when the royals found out that Diana had passed away. One thing I think that perhaps the royals will take a degree of comfort from, if they do indeed watch it, and we don't think any of them do, although Prince Harry said he did, is that they don't go down any conspiracy theory rabbit holes. I mean, that's really significant because obviously we had lengthy inquests into the death of Princess Diana, which found no wrongdoing or no MI5 stroke MI6 conspiracy, debunked myths like Diana was engaged to Dodie or indeed was pregnant with his baby. And I think it's a good thing that in this fictionalised account of factual events, Netflix haven't sought to be conspiracy theorists at all. Uh, Diana is depicted as somebody who is fond of Dodie to a point but certainly doesn't want to get remarried. They depict the idea of him buying her this dis-moi oui, tell me yes engagement ring as sort of happening by accident. They end up in a jewellery shop, she says oh that's a nice ring and he buys it for her. He is encouraged by his father to propose but Diana doesn't accept the proposal so the idea that they were engaged to be married which her nearest and dearest have always said was complete nonsense, isn't supported. Dodie comes out of it quite well, you know, this man facing heavy pressure from his father to control his personal life. We also get a depiction of the difficulty he faced because he had an American fiancé at the time who he basically had to dump on his father's say-so in order to ingratiate himself with the princess and indeed her sons. That's brave. We get an impression rightly or wrongly, from William and Harry that they weren't too keen on Dodie and were concerned about the idea of her remarrying. But we get the very strong impression of two things. First of all, that Diana didn't want to remarry Dodie or anyone at that point in her life. And secondly, and I do think this is accurate because in her book about Diana, Tina Brown did write this. Shortly before she died, there was a rapprochement of sorts between Charles and Diana. Tina Brown says that when she had lunch with Diana about a month before she died, Diana had spoken about how her relationship with Charles was a lot better. And she even, according to Tina Brown, spoke about the prospect of them maybe one day remarrying. The Crown doesn't go that far, but there's this conversation between Diana and Charles where they basically agree to have an amicable divorce and if they didn't do marriage very well that they should try and do co-parenting brilliantly. So it does end their relationship on a positive note. But then, you know, the royals aren't sitting down and watching The Crown and I don't think they're going to change their opinion on that anytime soon. We know, funny enough, that Camilla had made a few jokes about The Crown when she met the actress that played her in an earlier series. But um, it's not something that you're going to see people gathering around the popcorn at Sandringham, Highgrove, Buckingham Palace, Balmoral, where else? There isn't going to be a cinema screening of The Crown at any royal residence anytime soon.